chapter four. Here, what we want to do, deal with is some concepts um, in consolidating financial statements when you have a non-controlling or more than one non-controlling owners. Uh, used to be called minority owners, but I guess uh, they changed it, so it's now called non-controlling ownership. So uh, any shareholders who own less than 50.1%, I guess would be technically correct, uh, are considered non-controlling owners. And so understand that the corporation in control of another corporation doesn't have to own 100%. That the prerequisite here is that the acquiring corp have control over the acquired corp that doesn't require 100% ownership, obviously. Just requires enough stock ownership in the acquired company to have control, voting control. Microphone. Okay. Um, so just realize that. Well, what do you? What do you do with these non-controlling shareholders? How do you report their uh, financial interests going forward? And so that's, that's what we want to talk about. And so the ownership interests must be reflected by per FASB in the uh, consolidated financial reports and the non-controlling non interest in a sub is part of the equity of the consolidated group and so you might think of the the controlling corporation as kind of a almost like a fiduciary in that they're managing they're possessing and managing the subs assets even though they don't own all of the company and they're doing so for the benefit of these non-controlling shareholders and so next thing we want to do is talk about the valuation principles uh, that we have to deal with when we're accounting for a non-controlling interest. And so, again, uh, the parent with controlling interest must consolidate 100% of the subsidiary's financial information in their consolidated reports The acquisition method requires that the subsidiary be valued at the acquisition date, fair value, so that should sound familiar. Not, nothing changes there. And so when you have a non-controlling interest in the sub, what you have to do is uh, determine the total firm fair value and that's done by adding the fair value of the controlling interest to the ver fair value of the non-controlling interest at the acquisition date. Now this should be fairly easy but sometimes not so much. And so just like 
um, as we saw before, if the, the fair values of both the controlling interest and the non-controlling interest um, exceed the fair values of the net identifiable assets and liabilities uh, acquired, they're going to recognize goodwill. And so let's look at an example here. It's uh, the one in the book. So we have um, this Parker company who wants to acquire 90% of Strong Company. Strong stock has been trading for around 60% or 60% $60 per share. And again, this is for example purposes. We're really not going to talk about um, when we get to the second part of this paying a premium and how you account for that, but just go with how you value stuff. And so they're paying, Parker is paying uh, an additional amount per share to gain control of strong company and so even though it's trading for sixty dollars per share they're paying seventy dollars per share to entice strong shareholders to sell right because if they just offered sixty dollars per share strong's uh, shareholders might might not sell what's the incentive there right and so if Parker pays $70 per share to induce enough shareholders to sell, how will the 10% of strong that Parker does not own be recorded? Well, it kind of depends. Um, now, they give a couple of examples in the book. One is when the non-controlling shares continue to sell after the the acquisition at sixty dollars per share and i think that's what they show here and so they purchase the nine thousand nine thousand of the ten thousand outstanding shares ninety percent at seventy per share and so the value of the consider consideration transfer which is first and foremost to determine is 630,000. The remaining 10,000 shares trade at 60 per share. And so that's the fair value of the non-controlling interest. And so you're going to add those two amounts together, the 60,000, or excuse me, the 630,000 fair value of the controlling interest and then the 60,000 of the non-controlling interest. And so what you come up with is a total acquisition date fair value for strong of $690,000. And so here in this example, what you've got is a company whose fair value of assets and uh, acquired and liabilities assumed is valued at 600,000. And so, of course, you know by now that the, the difference is goodwill. So how does this goodwill get uh, allocated? Well, in this case, since the, uh, the amount of the value of the 10% of stock held by the non-controlling is the same as their 
fair value of the, the uh, identifiable net assets, both are 60,000, right? They're not going to get any of that allocation to goodwill. So that's what we're going to see here next. And so the parent first allocates goodwill to its controlling interest for the excess of the fair value of the parent's equity interest over its uh, share of the fair value of the net identifiable assets. So 600,000 times 90% is 540. And then goodwill is all allocated to the controlling and non-controlling interests. Note that this will not always be proportional to the percentages owned, but it usually is. And so total acquisition date fair value is 690. Fair value of the net identifiable assets, should say fair value of identifiable net assets, 600,000. So there's your total goodwill. How you allocate this uh, is the following. Uh, like I said, uh, fair value at acquisition date for the controlling interest is 630,000. which is that $70 uh, times 9,000 shares less the relative fair value of identifiable net assets acquired, which is the book value, well, the, the excuse me, not the book value, but the, the fair value of the net assets acquired times their 90% interest. So that's 540. So all 90% or all 90,000, there's a lot of 90s there. All 90,000 of that goodwill gets allocated to uh, the controlling interest to Parker. And note here, fair, like I said, fair value for the non-controlling interest is 60, which equals the their uh, allocation of the relative fair value of identifiable net assets acquired. So they're the same amount, no goodwill to them. Now they give a couple of examples in the book and I'm not sure they talk about it here. Um, what if, and this happens a lot, what if you can't Let's say we've got shares that are not actively sold. So there's not a market that you can look at to figure out if the non-controlling interest shares are selling at a certain amount. In this case, it was $60 per share. Um, how are you going to handle that? Well, you're just going to have to assume that the the amount that you're going to pay for your shares of the same uh, value per share that uh, well have the same market value as those shares owned by the uh, non-controlling interest shareholders so in this case that number would be seventy dollars per share for the non-controlling interest shares well, in that case, you're going to have um, a fair value of 70000 So the strongest total fair value would equal 700000 uh, in that case. Uh, their 10% would be 70,000. And if goodwill equaled not 90,000, but 100,000, then 
10,000 of that 100,000 would be allocated to the non-controlling interest in the form of goodwill. And then the other 90, of course, to the controlling interest. So there's an example of that on page 154. So, oh, here's the example of that. So if the shares were not actively traded, the 70% share uh, consideration transferred by Parker would be considered the best measure of fair value of the strong, and the fair value of the non-controlling interest would be estimated at 70,000. So there's your numbers, 700,000 total, broken down 630 to the controlling interest and 70,000 to the non-controlling interest and then there would be your allocation of goodwill. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is talk about allocating consolidated net income between the parent and the non-controlling interest. It's not real hard, but it just something that uh, you have to know how to do. All right, so assume that the relative ownership percentages of the parent and non-controlling interest represent an appropriate basis for attributing all elements of a subsidiary's income across the ownership groups. Okay. Include, including the excess fair value amortizations, including the excess fair value amortization basis, amortization is, is based on the assumption that the non-controlling interest represents equity in the subsidiary's net assets as remeasured on the acquisition debt. Well, I think that's a long way of saying um, we're, we're um, measuring 100% of the subs and the parents' net income. And we adjust those amounts for excess acquisition date, fair value over book value amortizations, as you saw in the last chapter. And so, um, barring some agreement, uh, you're going to allocate the income based upon the, the ownership interests of the parties. Well, who owns these ownership interests? Well, the parent owns 100% of the parent. And so the parent's going to recognize 100% of the income of the parent. And let's say they own 90% of the sub, they're going to recognize 90% um, of the income. And of course, they're going to be allocated 90% of the excess amortizations. And then the subsidiaries, non-controlling interest owners, they don't own anything in the parent. So nothing is reported to them on that. But they own, let's say in my example, 10% of the subs income plus 10% of the excess fair value over book value amortizations as well. So anyway, uh, if you read this and you're going, huh? I'm thinking the same thing. Well, that helps. All right, so they have an example in the book which is different than this example little bit. In this example, we have uh, the 
strong company again with revenues of $280,000, expenses of $200,000, so the sub's net income is 80, and then you have excess acquisition date, fair value amortization of 30, and so the net income adjusted for excess amortizations is 50,000, and then 10% of that is owned by the non-controlling interests, so they are uh, allocated 10% of the net in income adjusted for excess amortizations, or $5,000. And so if you look at the example in the book, what parent company Parker would uh, report in their consolidated net income allocation, which is uh, on page 155, it shows that Parker had consolidated net income of 108,000. They would subtract this 5,000. In the example in the book, it's 11,000 to come up with the net income attributable to the controlling interest, the parent. Now, Next thing we want to talk about is how you handle these consolidation consolidations when you don't own all of the sub. Um, it's basically the same consolidation entries we made before the SAIDE, SADE, and there are four other things you have to do. You have to calculate the four non-controlling interest figures and you have to include a new column in your uh, consolidation worksheet that shows these figures. <coughs> 